I'm Rob Vanstone, and welcome to the 107th edition of the Rider Rumblings video podcast. I can't count that high, but Mark Melnichuk, our, our producer, who's done such a great job for us through all 107 of these, or most of them, Austin Davis has also helped out with a few, has uh, kept a running tally. Uh, I am very pleased today, to, uh, we are very pleased today, uh, we being Murray McCormick and, and yours truly, to be joined by uh, Roco Radio's Jamie Nye of... Uh, Green Zone fame, CKOM, CJME, on every day from 2 to 6 p.m. Jamie, thank you so much for taking the time today. Yeah, no problem, guys. Um, there are myriad topics to discuss, um, this being the winter, and it's always football season in Saskatchewan. Yeah. I don't think it's ever not timely to discuss the Rough Riders. And um, one of the many reasons I thought about conscripting you for this podcast was, uh, you know, you've always kept a perpetual depth chart for this football team and uh which i have actually uh saved on my screen anytime i'm wondering okay who's 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 the candidate to play boundary cornerback uh i've always got your depth chart on my screen so um i'm just interested in your perceptions of this football team i realize it's a wide wide ranging question but you know murray and murray and i have both weighed in on this on, on podcast before what's your degree of uh comfortability or perhaps lack thereof with the Rough Riders as they're currently constituted? Well, well, that's a, a bunch of different aspects of it. And, of course, with the success of a football team, you look at the quarterback and where Cody Fajardo is. And, and I think uh, we, we've discussed it in pre-show meetings about where this team is. And, and you go, okay, how, how important is it for Jeremy O'Day, Craig Dickinson, and Cody Fajardo's to have a, an important season. Rob, you, you wrote about it on is it win or else type attitude. And I think more so than anybody in the organization, that's where we, we are with Cody Fajardo. I, I think he has to prove this season that he's worth another extension and worth to be the franchise guy. And I think a lot of people will be watching closely. Was 2019 his you know one-hit wonder season and he can't get it back again? Or was 2021 the anomaly and after, you know, a year and a half out of football and getting back into the groove, he's going to show better in 2022. So uh, I start there, and then you go around the offensive line. Have they improved enough? That, that's another one. They're going to have to prove it that they've imp that they've improved with Taron Vaughn just being healthy or Natai Rogers coming over from Ottawa. Is he an improvement on the right tackle spot? And can that interior, interior help and, and improve just with another season together? I would say... Yes, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a yes. I think they will improve with some of those things on the offensive line. Receiving core is pretty well set uh, outside of, you know, how long it takes Kyran Moore to get back. The run game is really interesting with Jamal Morrow. So offensively, uh, there are some big question marks uh, that need to be answered. Uh, and on the defensive side, again, the defensive line, especially the interior with some notable names leaving, but... Man, Garrett Marino was having a Rookie of the Year type campaign, so I think he can jump in as a regular starter. And Anthony Lanier showed uh, talent. They're deep at defensive back. And then there's some young guys in the secondary who are going to have to step up and fill holes of Luchez Pirafoy and Ed Ganey. So most definitely there are way more question marks going into this season hosting a Grey Cup than there was in 2013. But Jeremy O'Day... One thing I look at is he was there in 2013, but he was also there in 2014. He was also there in 2015. And how quickly uh, that deck of cards crumbled by having a one-and-done plan rather than sustained success plan. And that, that has been the modus operandi of this group is sustained success, being in West Finals and giving yourself a chance every single year. And uh, Jeremy O'Day clearly has shown he's not going to sell the farm to win now. Uh, because he's got a Grey Cup to win next year and a Grey Cup to win a year after that, et cetera, et cetera. Mer? Well, the only position you missed, Jerry, uh, Jamie, was linebackers, and that's the kind of position I'm excited to see on the field with uh, Darnell Sankey and Larry Dean and uh, Derek Moncrief and Micah Tights. He's got four, I think, solid linebackers that are really going to provide so much different opportunities and so much variety for Jason Shivers that – I think we, we kind of, maybe not overlooked it, you didn't overlook him by any stretch, he mm -hmm. just had a lot of positions there, but I'm really excited about Moncrief. Man, he was great in 19. He was like the best Sam in the league, and the fact that he's back there as the defense is going to, I think is going to be so much better. I'm with you on the interior of the defensive line, but I'm also, with, I'm with you on Garrett Green. I was laying in bed 
this morning trying to think about what Rob was going to get us to talk about. And Marino kept coming to my mind about the, how he, well he played and he got that knee injury. So maybe, you know, they, I think they're going to be better off than we thought they're going to be interior-wise. But I'm, going to, I'm saying it's all hooking on the offensive line. If the offensive line doesn't play better, do the riders improve? Well, maybe not. But if the offensive line can play better with Natty Rogers and Taryn Vaughn and the, the three, the guards and the center are all good, then I think mm. if they ha- the offensive line has to be better for the riders to improve to make the next step to the Great Cup. Because you and I, we all know the Winnipeg Blue Bombers haven't lost a step. They've lost a couple of guys, but it looks like they've gotten stronger. And that's the team everybody's chasing in the league right now. And that's, I think that's you have to measure yourself against what you've done to improve yourself against the Blue Bombers right now. And I, the Riders have done about everything they can, but I think the Blue Bombers have done a whole lot more right now. Well, that's, a, that's the battle of can you beat the best, and the best is the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And is that offensive line going to be able to get it done against Willie Jefferson and Jackson, Jeff Goat, et cetera, et cetera? Of course, they lost Stove Richardson to BC, who I think is – maybe one of the most underrated signings in the CFL is Richardson going to the BC Lions. But uh, I, I still look at that bomber front seven as, yeah, that's going to be a tough team to beat. And they need to be better. But Logan Furlan's going to be better this year. Like, he, he was a raw rookie out of junior. And, and look at the growth Dan Clark showed from year to year after being a starter. So, And then Matlin Riley was just, he was unfortunate with the injuries and things like that, but he's a first-round pick, so they're high on Matlin Riley as well. So I think there's some some improvement there and maybe a little bit more competitive training camp, especially at the tackle spots because they were getting injured and guys were quitting, and it was just a, a tough place to be in. So uh, I believe they will improve. Will they improve enough to be able to beat the Winnipeg Blue Bombers? Uh, well, there's a few games this season where that's going to – play out on the field of course it's got to be a better oh sorry rob it's got to be a better start to training camp okay sorry um you mentioned uh earlier 2013 and it was sort of a one and done or all you know put all the chips in one uh, move all the chips in one direction but in 2014 they were eight and two and then their starting quarterback gets hurt and everything falls apart are the rough riders not working again working without a net as they were post-2013 and that after Darian Durant there was nothing and they have nothing proven or even remotely proven after Cody Fajardo. Well we know they're high on Mason Fine. They were high coming into training camp and I I think that was a quick decision to make to make him the backup over Isaac Harker after that game in Hamilton so I think another that they're they're banking on and this is what good general managers do um, is they bank on their scouting staff. They bank on what Paul Jones is doing, and you have to. That's how John Huffnagel and John Murphy built those teams in Calgary over the years, and Huffnagel continues to do it. It's having faith in yourself that we have, we can find the next talent because you can't pay every starter $150,000 uh, because if all those starters are making good starter money, well, then you got no money for anywhere else depth-wise, and they were so right up against it in 2013. I, I, they they had they were one one injury cost them that thirteen or seventeen thousand dollar fine. That's how tight they were against the salary cap. The, there was just one. I think it was Rod Williams. They signed him to a bonus, and then he got hurt in the first or second game he returned from the NFL, and that put him over the cap. That's how tight it was, and that's not sustainable because the next year everybody's going to want to raise after you win the Grey Cup, and then what are you going to do? So, Jeremy O'Day is being patient he is being very thoughtful and he's not putting all the chips in Uh, of course he says he's putting all the chips in all the time but uh, I mean like he's not going to go and push this team to a point where they're oh no we're 50 60 thousand dollars over the cap because of a few injuries he's not going to put that team in that predicament so uh, I'm I'm very interested in how Jeremy O'Day pulls this off and is he the next John Huffnagel? Is he the next Kyle Walters who can keep some things sustainable, have their system in place, and just keep rolling and build a culture that guys want to re-sign in Saskatchewan? So th- this season's uh, going to tell me a lot about Jeremy O'Day and what what he is as not only a general manager for the next few years, but like a general manager like we've seen from Huff in Calgary who's been there since 2008. Like that's 
fifth, this is his 15th season in Calgary. That is uh, almost unheard of in the Canadian Football League. I also think training camp has got to go better than the way it started last year, even before it started. And you think about it, we kind of forget about those four guys that got hurt a little bit, Larry Dean, Freddie Bishop III, Nelson McCombo, and Jonathan Fo Coley. Femme, Cole. Femme Cole. Femme Cole. How well, you know, what they could have meant to this team, to special mm -hmm. teams, to LeCombo. And they're going to be supposedly back and being healthy, supposedly. So I think if, things, if they can avoid... A catastrophe that happened on that Thursday before training camp opened. I think they'll be a little better shaped too by that. But we all remember what that day was like. How many six, uh, torn Achilles? Six torn Achilles on them last year? That's an incredible number. I think that's enough for a long, long, for many, many, many more seasons. So if they can avoid those type of injuries, I think they can also be better too. Uh, and you look at the, the depth all of a sudden, you know, they're they thinking of putting Dion Lacey at, at defensive end. And when you talked about Darnell Sankey, I was thinking, okay, could he line up at defensive end or a three, four rush linebacker type put, to put those four linebackers out there? If Larry Dean comes in and he's completely healthy and we see an interesting rotation because AC Leonard is just an athlete who gets after the quarterback and Darnell Sankey is uh, similar to that. So I'm curious what they do there. Maybe it's Dante or maybe it's Moncrief or something like that. Derek Moncrief. So I, I'm interested on how things work out on how they shuffle those guys around uh, but Nelson Lacombo is a guy I'm excited to see. He was a superstar at the University of Saskatchewan with the Huskies in defense, and he is similar to Mike Edom where he seems like he can be the utility knife who you can put him at Sam, you can put him at half, you can put him at safety, and they can rotate some of those guys around. So, And Godfrey Onyeka, they, they're starting to build some good Canadian depth in those positions, which is vital, we all know, uh, to win a Grey Cup. And we have another draft coming up to see where they go. So uh, with those little things and I and of course these guys are going to be I think a little closer to ready football shape so to speak where you're not seeing popped Achilles on the first day of training uh, for the Rough Riders so I think that that is one of those you'll never see it again like all the broken legs and what year was that 2008 or something like that it was just ridiculous and we knew that's never going to happen again the uh, Randy Ambrosi is on his road trip next week or soon stops in Regina on the evening of March 17th from 7 to 8 30 at the Harvard 620 lounge at Mosaic um obviously there's going to be a lot of fanfare around that but generally it, it's been a pretty quiet off season for the Canadian Football League outside of Edmonton where it seems like the Elks are and, and are very proactive and you've dealt with that on on your show with the new CEO um have we seen this new business plan this new marketing zest that I think during the pandemic period we were led to believe was going to be part of a revitalized CFL. To me, it just seems like it's the same old deal. Yeah, yeah that's. I feel we're sold a bill of goods every year at the State of the League uh, addressed by the commissioner about all the forward thinking that's going on, and then when rubber meets the road, it's the same old, same old, except for what we're seeing from Victor Quee right now with the Edmonton Elks, uh, a president and CEO uh, we've never seen like this. Uh, a new age CEO who is up with social media, is engaging with fans. He's DMing fans. He's uh, like, he is totally in it. And he's willing to take some heat off that too, uh, uh, because of that too, uh, which is clear. So he, he's that new era, new energy in the, the Canadian Football League. And if I think we could copy and paste nine Victor Quees across the league, in all those, all the markets, including this one, it would have energy. It would have, you know, uh, that all of a sudden passion growing again because it can't just be, and we heard Randy Ambrosi talk about it, it can't just be Winnipeg and Saskatchewan and sometimes Edmonton and then hold on for dear life everywhere else that you have a good year on the field to, to get the tickets. It, it can't be that way. And uh, I'm feeling a little bit of a re-, re re-energized CFL but it's not because of you know a huge marketing thing this genius sports deal where they're now you know investors or partners and part of the pie so to speak. they're going to get part of the pie of the CFL we we haven't seen it and maybe we won't see it genius works kind of behind the radar with technology and providing information on fans and data and those types of things that the league then can use for their marketing I hope we start to see it, but it starts to feel same old, same old again, where 
we're never gonna, we're not gonna waste this crisis and we're gonna do the we're re-energized and here we go and outside of Victor Kui it's been the same you know stories it's been the same schedule it's been the same here we go it's the draft and it's the combine it's the global combine and stuff like that and that there's nothing new going on and I we need to see new in the Canadian Football League and we haven't quite seen it yet out outside of a hire in Edmonton you're not excited about the combine starting this week? Chance for all these young <laughs> No, that doesn't really generate a whole lot of excitement. I look at the names, it's just names. But I remember not too recent, we had CFL week about this time, which was a blast, which was really, yeah. uh, in fact, they only got to put it in two cities that they knew would be successful in two, which was really important. But they haven't really had that opportunity. We also forget, maybe I'm going to get, there's still a pandemic going on, guys. What, what do you want the CFL to do? in a pandemic to maybe draw people like everyone keeps saying they're not doing this. They're not doing that. What should they be doing guys? Give me an example. Have you seen of, any marketing? Well, that's right. Where's the of marketing? And Randy Ambrosi starting his uh, road trip, which I know is a thing he does, but you've been those, those things are well received by fans. Like that's Randy Ambrosi getting out. I think the Ottawa Redbacks doing the behind the scenes video was pretty good. I don't think the league did a, a strong enough job of promoting that. But I think that's something that's NFL, very NFL like, very far behind the scenes and all those kind of things. And I know it's because... I, and that's what I mean. Like, like you have this behind the R footage that Ottawa has, and it's there's no hype around it. Like, they released their second episode last week. Uh, it's at, the, like, the last Saturday of every month is when they release it. And we're not seeing, you know, that pump up, the publicity, the clips on social media, the teases coming up. Yes, it's a, an Ottawa Red Blacks thing, but... Uh, this could be something the CFL latches onto as sort of their hard knocks type show and, and lead into it. And, and that's that's where I'm at is where you have this stuff, you have content to really drive it. And you have the Ottawa Red Blacks doing a little bit of it, but I, it's always it's always more. They can always do more, and that's where I'm I, I am on it, which is, Man, I know the resources they have. I know the people they have. They have great people. They have the, uh, at CFL offices. This is their job is to create the content. I'm one of those. I write for CFL.ca, right? But when you have this behind the R stuff, you know, keep it going. Uh, like, create the momentum. Have some things leading into that Saturday. Pump the you-know-what out of it on Saturday when it launches to get people watching because I was, I was intrigued by it. It was kind of, it's cool to go behind the scenes and see how it works. And it's only 13, it was only 13 minutes long. It's not, it's a coffee break to watch this thing. And I think that's where the content is now. You can't have two hour long documentaries. People don't have the time for that, so to speak, but to watch a show in 10 minutes during a coffee break on inside the CFL or behind the R it's great content, push it out better. And I mean, it just seems to me that you know you can call you can refer to this as the CFL's off season, but it's the most crucial time of the year when it comes to selling tickets. This is when the season tickets are being sold. This is when they're basically trying to get their revenue streams going so that they're reliable during the season and they're not dependent on work, walk up, which then factors in weather, etc., and all sorts of all sorts of very variables that can be detrimental to ticket sales. I just you know, just from the top down, I just think they should have their foot, the, the gas pedal slammed down, tw you know, 12 months a year, seven days a week. And I just don't see that. And if if the pandemic and then the, the, the horrible product that they put on the field last season and, and the concomitant um, reduction in attendance don't wake them up and, and attune them to the imperatives mm -hmm. of really selling this product, what will? Uh, well, it's it's going to be the the one thing that sells is what you said. It's the product. It's on the field. It's got to be entertaining again. It's got to be high flying again. Uh, that's where it starts and ends. Is what you are on the field needs to be there. Uh, but to get people watching and to get that product, what are you doing off the field to drive them there to even want to watch uh, and and stick around? Like the NFL never goes away. Their calendar it rolls through the year and it's. You know, the Super Bowl is over and it rolls like a month later. They're doing the combine and now it's the free agent or the franchise tag deadline. And then the new year starts in a couple of. So then we go into free agency right away. And then 
the draft. Like it just rolls and rolls and rolls. Where the CFL goes, it went Grey Cup, and then you waited for that week before free agency, which was good. It was great stuff. But since then, the word Crickets. yeah, it's going okay. Where are we going? They need that. They, they need a early March, and that's when CFL week was. That, that's when they brought that in. It was a great idea. I know with the pandemic, you're not going to be able to do that. And the Combine's in Indianapolis every year. Is that something the league has to look at? Is it just, let's go to Saskatchewan? Because that's where the media heartbeat is. Like, look at all the reporters that cover the CFL in this market compared to the other ones. So we're going to be covering it. We're going to be there. They're going to send TSN. They're going to send partners. And we can get into that debate as well on the TV contract. This being a, an exclusive league in television, I think, has been a detriment to the league uh, because Sportsnet completes, completely ignore, ignores it. Other people completely ignore it because it is an exclusive, and I know they get a lot of money out of it. But I think that's also what drives the NFL and other leagues is they have TV, TSN. As much as they're not the national hockey person anymore, they still have Leaf games. They still have Jet games. Uh, they still have Ottawa games and Montreal games to promote and get people watching. And Sportsnet is doing the same, and CBC still has a piece. So when the, when that contract comes up, I would really like to see like what the NFL does with their feature games. Amazon wants Thursday night. Okay, Sportsnet, do you want Friday night football? Okay, TSN, you don't want to give that up? Okay, TSN, give us some money. for If that's the franchise, you pay us. What do you want, Sportsnet? You want Thursday night football? You want Saturday night football? Something you can build a brand around as well? I, I think you really have to look at that as much as TSN has been a fantastic partner for the league. I think exclusive TV deals actually doesn't benefit the grand scheme of things in the CFL is to a bigger, broader audience. We need to take our halftime break. This will be a uh, very momentary break so that uh, Marie and I can actually... Uh Hope to counter the wisdom that uh, we're hearing from Mr. Nye. We'll be right back after this short intermission. And that's the end of the short intermission. We're back. Um, Jamie, you spoke before the break about the uh, TV deal. And it wasn't something I had on my list of, of questions, but I think it's a really intriguing topic. And it's something about which you're obviously passionate. I know Murray and I have talked about this amongst ourselves uh, Um it's 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 to me the TSN thing has always struck me as a there's some positives and some negatives. I mean they've basically been the benefactor or a key benefactor of the league since they had had the assumed the exclusive rights and I think it's arguable that the CFL might not even exist in a recognizable form if not mm -hmm. for TSN. But to what extent are they well served by this arrangement in terms of exposure? And um, one thing that's always kind of I've noted is like, you know, TSN is the world junior network. They've got the rights and they just pump world junior through sports center and whatever you watch TSN sports center. And you wouldn't guess in a million years, most of the time that TSN is the CFL's exclusive rights holder. I think a lot more can be done within that model to keep getting, you know, to keep oh. pumping interest in the CFL because sports center just seems allergic to it, but we'll have our Aaron Rodgers updates all the time. Well, change the score bug would be one thing. Uh, like it's been the same uh, score bug. Uh, I, that's when one thing is the image, the the look of TSN. It, it's almost the same as it has been since the exclusive takeover happened in 2008 when they or 2000 yeah 2008 because I think CBC was last game was the 2007 Grey Cup. Uh, so that's where I look at those little things. Can you put timeouts on the score bug like college football and well even I was watching U Sports programs that had the timeouts displayed like just little things like that where it's like please can we do something there uh, but overall like tsn has been a fantastic partner have they did they save the cfl absolutely and they're at the table on a lot of these things they're in the room so that's why it's i it might be impossible for them to get out of the ex exclusivity deal unless tsn says mm, we don't want to we don't want to do that anymore and that would be devastating for the league uh, but uh, and that's what I uh, but I I look at how the NFL drives. They have ABC, CBS, Fox, and NBC are all partners. And when you when you see where are the games on, they're partners to the point of you're going to get this game on CBS. You're going to get this game on Fox. They don't ignore it, right? Like 
sometimes during the World Juniors, Sportsnet, you barely see much on the World Juniors, maybe a score, but they don't go, they're not going all in like TSN is. And I, I agree with you on what you said about can TSN do even more? Uh, with budgeting, I, I don't know if they have the will to. Uh, to be quite honest, and that's unfortunate because they know, and they they know they have a great product. FRC uh, meetings every year at Grey Cup Week. TSN has a whole table there, and they're they're there, and their reporters are there, and they love the CFL. But you wonder what constraints are from above that if the viewers aren't there on a for a Wednesday show, are they going to put the production cost into it? And the answer has clearly been no. I also think people make the assumption that Sportsnet and CBC want the CFL back. I don't know if I've seen, maybe it's their lack of interest that gets me so that maybe they're not all that interested. It's the financial commitment. TSN has made that commitment to that. So I wonder if these big networks, do we keep thinking, do they want to make that commitment? Because same thing you talk about budgets and staff, CBC staff has gotten marginally smaller. It doesn't seem to be that way in Olympic year. So I wonder if they're really interested in that. Maybe it's just fans and media who are proposing this and the guys who decide what the coverage is going on. They're saying, you know, the CFL is kind of a regional network in a sense that TSN does it. But I don't, I don't see putting CFL games on Sportsnet and CBC being the sol solving all the CFL's woes. I think TSN has become destination viewing on a Friday night. They're not giving up Friday night football for anything. And the double headers are great. And plus, when you keep comparing everything in all the NFL, there's only four games a week, guys. You haven't got a whole lot of wiggle room to start spreading about games all over other, other networks and stuff. So I think I kind of I know I may be going against you guys. I think the idea of the exclusivity of TSN can the game use some, yes can some bumpy can the score bug use timeouts on it. I'm trying to remember if they if it's the NFL or the TSN that has the, the timeouts on the bottom of the score bug. I think it might be the NFL. And I agree with you. They, they can do some freshening of the game and maybe finding other ways to present it. But I, I think keep it on TSN. Everybody you know has TSN. It's not going to make any difference if it's not. they have to go hunting on another television station. I say exclusively TSN. So there's my, my rant for the day, Rob. You're next. Well, I, you know, I look at the people they have, and I, none of this is, is, is intended as a, as a criticism of the people they have. In fact, my intent is to compliment them. But you know, there's Dave Naylor, and there's Farhan Lalji, and there's, there's Glenn Suter. I mean, tremendous people. I'd just like to see them use them more, you know, use them more during Sports Center. Uh, have a, you know, not too long from now, there's going to be NHL Trade Center, and the whole world is going to be wondering about uh, where Chitrin goes, or whatever his name is. And this is going to be huge stuff and it's just going to be boring as can be and uh the, the the cfl's free agency period free agency day was what it's evolved into is way more entertaining way more interesting why not dedicate especially when you have five channels why not dedicate some live coverage taking advantage of these tremendous people you have like dave naylor farhan lalji etc glenn Suter. let's use them let's use them live let's use them during a what would usually be a dead time of the year and a dead time of the day i just if you're the league's rights holder, I think that's just a, that's an easy one for you. I'd love to see them just be more invested and showcase the people that they have to a greater yeah, I, extent. Yeah, I, and that's where I, what I said earlier, which is there, if the will's there, but the view, they don't think the viewers are going to be, the, the, the will drops on doing that stuff. And we've seen them try to do some streaming things, uh, and they've decided, okay, free agent day in the CFL and – a random Tuesday in February ain't lighting people up to go to a channel on TSN to watch a show. But is it a rap show at five o'clock at night? Uh, the five to six, an hour long. He went there. He went there. What are you seeing? Interviews with Cody Fajardo, whatever, whoever signs with anybody. It, it, you are the exclusive rights holder. It's not like anybody says no to TSN when they have interview requests for those types of things. So I, I absolutely see it. And to Murray's point on is anybody else interested, that is a 100% fair point. Is Sportsnet actually interested in coughing up money for this? Maybe not because they look at it and go, we have baseball in the summer and we have hockey in the fall. So where where are we going to put uh, a game if we're not getting Friday nights? We're not putting the Saturday games on up against Hockey Night in Canada for us. And, you know, in baseball season, we're not going up against the Jays on a Saturday afternoon. So – that leaves them out of the equation, potentially? Absolutely. Last week, the 
we heard that there was a theme for the 2020, 2022 Grey Cup, bring it back to the heartland. I don't think this is going to be something that's as memorable as huddle up in Saskatchewan or even flat out in 2003. Uh, but um, there was that. I don't sense that there's a real Grey Cup buzz building, but it's, I don't think there's a real novelty to a Grey Cup coming to Regina. In, in 95, it was such a big deal because we never imagined we'd even see this. Uh, and now there have been two subsequent Grey Cups in Regina, and one of them, the Rough Riders have won. So we've, I think we've pretty much seen everything you're going to see from a Grey Cup, except for the fact that it's in the new stadium here. What's, what kind of vibe are you getting, Jamie, with the, with the Grey Cup coming here? Uh, not a lot of vibe. On, like, 2013, it had a different feel. I don't know mm -hmm. what it was. Maybe it's because Brendan Tamman was, you know, went out and got G. Roy Simon and Ricky Foley, and there's the John Chick drama right before training camp, and those types of signings were coming down, so it led to excitement about it. Uh, I'm really interested in the first game of the season and what that stadium looks like, especially coming through that pandemic, and there was 24, 25,000 people there, uh, sold out Labor Day. They brought in the pat passport the vaccine passport and we were down to like 17,000 people showing up to games and it just felt like the buzz wasn't there so I'm really interested on the opening games in summer and what we see attendance wise because usually a Grey Cup year when you buy a ticket you can get a Grey Cup ticket you know it's it's the hottest ticket in town all summer and into the fall to go to a rider game and I don't know if that's going to be the case this year or not uh, because the vibe I get, even talking about the riders on the show, it's people aren't really jumping on the f phone lines and engaging on what's going on with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. And maybe it's because Jeremy O'Day has been pretty well stay the course and no big name signings outside, you know, Sankey and Moncrief, but, and the Duke Williams thing, but, uh, that's where I'm at in Rider Nation. Maybe I'm completely misplaying it. Maybe people are just really fired up to go to Mosaic. But the group I'm around, it's guarded on what they expect from the team and the league in 2022. I think sports fans are slow to come back to anything right now. And I know you're seeing the attendance numbers in the NHL. The games I watch, the highlights I watch, I see there's lots of empty seats. Calgary has lots of empty seats. Edmonton, these... Teams that are pretty good, even except for Toronto, is always always filled in Toronto. So I think sports fans are still getting used to the idea of going, coming back. Even even you look at this slowly, we we're slowly getting concerts back in our lives. Like Chris Stapleton's mm -hmm. coming, uh, Nelson Ratcliffe has just got announced for two of my favorite bands, by the way. So anyway, night sweats. So I think I think people are still adjusting to that, Jimmy. I still think we're getting the idea. Like I don't know about you, but I went shopping the other day at Safeway and I tucked my mask in my pocket. And I didn't wear it for the first couple of minutes and I put it on just because I felt more comfortable. So I think we're still getting used to being whatever normal is going to be. And I think fans are going to be a little more reluctant to jump on there, go to Mosaic Stadium with that. And I think they're just going to take a little bit of time to warm up. And right now we're also coming back. If you talk about coolness towards the rise, we're coming off the Olympics, which was a big, and the, you know, the time frame of that when the time changed, it was a commitment to keep in touch with the Olympics. Yeah. And we all did. And we loved every second of it. Now we're in the brand. I think it's a time of year when it's, Fans are just slowly getting back to things. And I think I'm kind of optimistic that it might come back and it'll start building towards that Grey Cup thing. And that's because it's going to be a festival. We don't know what kind of festival it's going to be like, but it's going to be pretty cool. And I think fans are just going to be a little slow to embrace what our new normal is. And hopefully our new normal involves more than having to wear masks and those kind of things. And maybe it'll start picking up once the football season gets in, whenever training camp gets rolls around. Well, and it's, it's weird because that's that's this market where I'm feeling a little bit, and maybe it's the same old, same old. It's just rider fans are going to show up. But, but I do feel like I feel an energy around the CFL as a whole, and maybe that's the Edmonton Elks and, you know, the new branding and selling more season tickets than ever before. But even in Ottawa and uh, Hamilton, now what's going to happen in Vancouver, Toronto, and uh, Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal are going to be very interesting uh, coming out of this. But... I feel there's a little bit of an uptick broadly CFL on where we're going and what this league's going to do. And I do believe the product on the field is going to be better. Because if it's not, well, then we're in big trouble. 
but I really do believe that the product on the field is going to improve uh, in 2022, and it's going to be maybe not all the way back to where it was, you know, five, six, seven years ago when there was a lot of 35, 33 games or anything like that, but I think it'll be a lot better than, you know, 20 to 17 every week uh, in the Canadian Football League. What gives you that feeling, Jamie? I, I just look around the, the team and uh, the teams going in, and I think Jeremiah Masoli is going to make Ottawa better at quarterback. I think Dane Evans is still a great quarterback. I think Toronto still is going to be a good team. Montreal with Vernon Adams Jr. and who knows Trevor Harris. They have a, a good offense gelling here in Saskatchewan. It's going to be interesting what Winnipeg without you know Andrew Harris, who's gone to Toronto. I believe I Mitchell and the Calgary Stampeders with Reggie Bagleton and Kamar Jordan and those guys and uh, like back together again. Uh, BC is a big question mark on what they, they they have a good receiving core and Edmonton's another one. Those are the two teams where I'm like I have no idea what to expect from the BC Lions and the Edmonton Elks at all. But overall, I just I just feel like there's it's going to be a very competitive Canadian Football League and a very competitive East Division. Uh, in that Canadian Football League and Calgary, Saskatchewan, and Winnipeg and maybe some wild cards with Edmonton and BC fighting it out in the West again. I, that's what fires me up about the, the season. I think it's going to be competitive and I don't see a couple of dogs like Ottawa and Edmonton and BC were last year. I just don't see that happening again. Hey, no disparaging dogs here. No, sorry. There she is. <laughs> Isn't she adorable? Say hi, Candy. <laughs> there had to be one. There had to be one. Uh, yeah, uh, Candy uh, shot uh, during the podcast. She's so Is cute. it really Ryder Rumblings without Candy? <laughs> yeah, she's so cute. Hey, Mur, Mur, you're so I, cute too, Mur. I kind of have to say that I really like the Edmonton S Elks new logo. I know it's not new or the old logo. I I kind of like the way it looks. I know that's kind of Edmonton seems to be doing everything. But what do you think of that logo? I I like the Elks logo too. I thought it had. Potential they could have hang on to, but I like the double E. I think that's a no. You're an old Edmonton guy, Jamie. You worked there for a while. What do you think of that new logo? Well, that's that's where Victor Quiz won. Is he went out to the fans and what do you want? And I never, I never understood why they went away from the double E. Like they ticked off so many people, long time people there by changing the name. Period. And then they got rid of the double E and and went to the the elk logo, which I was like, mm, eh, okay, sure. It's there. Uh, and, it, and it's still part of their marketing, of course, uh, that elk logo. But on the helmet, it's the double E. And it's the most, maybe the most recognizable logo uh, when you talk about CFL heritage brand logos. Like that double E means the evil empire. It means, you know, the, the Edmonton football team and domination and all those Grey Cups and Warren Moon and everything else. And that, that's important. That would be like the Toronto Maple Leafs going, we're going to get rid of the Leaf. I, what? No, it's we're not playing. We're, we're just going to put Toronto on the front of our jersey and not play with the Leaf anymore. Like, no, that's it's such a, an iconic brand. It would be like Saskatchewan getting rid of the S. You just don't do it. Um, and so that's what Victor Kui I think heard from the fans, and uh, I'm glad to see the the double E back on the helmet. And, and I, I like how they went kind of new school with the enlarged double E, yeah. but they also went old school with the font uh, like they used to wear back in the Warren Moon days as well. Uh, right. I'm just going to mention, as we're talking about the the Elks had to do something, guys. The way they left that franchise last year, winless at home, not even a, a thought when they came on. There wasn't a star on that team that could really you know, maybe help a little bit, but they, they had to do something. They were as bad in position marketing-wise in that market as I've ever seen the great Eskimos, Elks, sorry, well, the Eskimos. Remember when the Eskimos used to dominate the CFL? I'm reading Paul Wood's books right now about the uh, rocket, year of the rocket. And he goes into quite detail about the uh, Eskimos and how they how dominant they were. And you remember back in those days? Like, they were the flagship franchise regardless of what happened. And last year, they were, there was Ottawa and Edmonton kind of neck and neck for two irrelevant franchises. I think part of the things they had to do, they had to go out and get Chris Jones. They had to do it. And Chris Jones is doing all the things he's done here from signing Deron Carter till. If you look on Edmonton's website, there's how many, five or six or seven free agent camps that he's renowned for conducting, charging guys 100 bucks to come try out. We can get our colleague Daryl Davis to talk about that. He always liked that one, the free <laughs> agent camps. <laughs> but I think Edmonton had to do something, and maybe that's 
kind of overlooked a little bit right now is they, they were in such a bad position that they had to do make some changes there, oh, that, which is that, good that for them. Franchise, that entire franchise was broken. Uh, Brock Sunderland, uh, he ticked off a lot of people. Uh, Chris Presson, who was the CEO and president, who, you know, he was running in, indoor football leagues in Arizona. He was an American. I, I made When they hired him, I went, what? There's so many great Edmonton business people who are connected to that franchise. And he went with a guy from Arizona to, to run this iconic franchise. Like, what do you know? With the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, how would Rider fans feel if they go, oh, our new CEO and president is some dude who ran an indoor football league in Florida, and he's going to come and talk to us about tradition? Of so Like, no, that's not how organizations work. So especially in the Canadian Football League, especially with a community-owned team uh, in Edmonton. Uh, yeah, they, they blew it up, and Victor Cui's a great start, and I, oh, I'm so interested in what Chris Jones is going to do. Like, we, we, we lived it for three years, and it was fun every day. There was something going on every day, and I can't wait to see what happens with the Edmonton Elks under the direction of Chris Jones. Well, he's already said some things about Cody Fajardo that are certain to be revisited early in the season when the Riders play the uh, Elks. Um, how much of a do you think that will do just to fuel that rivalry again and create interest? As much as there seems to be an effort to downplay it, that's basic marketing. Oh, yeah. And we'll see how, it, how it's played up. Uh, we'll ask Cody about it going into that week for sure. Uh, maybe Jason Moss. Chris Jones will duck and dodge. Uh, because he was backing up, he he was backing up Stephen McAdoo on well, what he was, but he pretty much said Cody Fajardo can't throw the football <laughs> in, in the Canadian Football League after he was one of the best deep passers in 2019 and led the league in passing uh, that season. So uh, it, it's going to ramp it up, and we need more of that. Mm -hmm. We need a ton more of that in the Canadian Football League, and it doesn't have to be necessarily trash talk all the time, but people willing to be open a little bit more like open the curtain like the what we get in the canadian football league is you know a, a lot of people who are worried about saying too much it's like no just be honest and have some character that's another thing that's lacking in the cfl is character who are the who's the face of the canadian football league like when we had Ricky Ray and Anthony Calvillo and even back when it was, you know, Doug Flutie, Gizmo was a household name, uh, pinball, like wh who's the guy in the Canadian Football League who people would know and see on the street? Uh, I can't name one who would have that type of personality that people just know and uh, go to. Maybe it was Mike Riley, Bo Levi Mitchell, potentially, but um, I, I don't see that right now. And that's a big problem in the Canadian Football League is brand identity and star identity. Uh, and I don't know if there's much of either across Canada. Is that I'll, uh, part? Uh, well, Murray, one, one, fi one final question and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Murray, you have the last one and then Jamie will give you a floor to talk about whatever you'd like to discuss and also give people an idea of where they can uh, find you. Oh, no, the pressure, the pressure. What am I going to say? I had something really exciting to say. Last year, we also maybe got in the way of promoting the CFL, like marketing stars, we were all stuck on Zoom calls. And there was, there was a lack of the one-to-one -one sort of uh, relationships you could start forming with players and maybe seeing a guy like, I'm trying to think of Jonathan Woodward, who had a great personality. Woodard, Woodard mm -hmm. had a great personality, but we only got him through Zoom, so we never really got to know the guy, what type of player he was and that kind of thing. So... Hopefully we're back to a world where we can actually get some one-on-one -on -one time with guys, get to know them, get to present them in a manner that's a little different than going on a Zoom call where everybody else takes the one quote he has and finds their own way of putting it in their own context. So maybe with a return, as I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, a return to normal maybe provide us an opportunity to uh, to sell these guys a little bit, to maybe market them a little more than, than Cody Fajardo and say there are other guys on the riders who have personality like Jamal Morrow and uh, Micah Johnson was another guy with a lot of personality and things like that. Duke so, Williams yeah, has got tons of personality. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah that, let's uh, see that, it. Let's hear it. Uh, hopefully in the, like the NFL, uh, you're, you're, we're allowed to be in person again and those types of things because it helps. It, it helps build 
when people hear their stories and they could be heartbreaking stories or, you know, down on your luck stories or just a guy who likes to laugh and have fun and, you know, maybe talk some trash uh, <laughs> going into a game. It, it's all good. Uh, and rather than three guys a day when, you, you know, when back in 2019, it, it wasn't, it was, you got three guys, one person got three guys a day, but that meant there were nine, 10, 11, 12 players talking every single day. And there's so many stories and so many things that come out of that rather than just three guys and the coach total in one day. So uh, hopefully those protocols end and the fans get to see a little bit more of uh, the, the, and they're great guys. There's a lot of great guys in the Canadian Football League that you can be fans of. Rod, can I just make one more last statement? Uh, sure. Yeah. I just want, Jamie and I are big time curling fans. I know that. We've got two Saskatchewan teams that might get a chance to end this curse 42 years. I don't know. Did you watch last night's game between Cooey and uh, Dunstan? I missed a little bit of it, but I uh, watched the last oof, oh, last half of the game. Uh, I picked it up in the sixth end, but I missed a couple of the great shots in the early going. Uh, but uh, that win was a statement win by Matt Dunstone against Kevin Cooey in Alberta, in Lethbridge, in front of the fans. There, There's even a little chirping back and forth, Murr. So uh, they were having some fun, but Matt Dunstone's rink's doing well. Colton Flash made one major mistake yesterday, which led to the loss to Botcher, but... Uh, he's got a chance, and hopefully we, we see it. But, yeah, uh, it's going to be an interesting weekend of curling. People tell me, Jamie, curling, what's your week like? Uh, sorry, sorry, go ahead, Rob. Jamie, ahead, what's Rob. your week like coming up in the green zone? Anything you'd like to uh, – the soapbox is yours. Does anybody even use soapboxes anymore? That's such an archaic term. Anyway, this is your uh, – your uh, only short corner, television Jamie. reporters who have to stand next to very tall television reporters <laughs> when the, uh, the soapboxes uh, come out. I think Lee Jones used to use that trick uh, back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, uh, on the green zone this week, it's going to be uh, probably, well, it's a lot of keeping up with uh, the Major League Baseball negotiations. And Aaron Rodgers just signed a monster contract to stay in, in, in Green Bay. So, oh, did he? Oh, My Bronco know. dream is destroyed. Yeah, no. Sorry, Rob. Yeah. Good thing I'm not a Calvin Ridley fan, too. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry, go man. ahead. I'm crushed. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I hope you didn't bet on Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> I lost 1500 bucks. <laughs> yeah, going to Denver. Uh, but, yeah, uh, and uh, a lot about about the Canadian Football League. We had Danny Austin on the show this week, and we talked about what, you know, with Major League Baseball, I'm watching this CFL-CFL-PA negotiation, and Randy's going on a road trip, so clearly it's nothing ur urgent on that front. But I just don't want to do this again where we're sitting at training camp Murray, we were out for dinner when they had that CBA go down at training camp. You were waiting for me to finish my supper when that news uh, broke. And, and you, Joel, and I had to rush out the door to go cover a new CBA in the middle of training camp. I don't want that again. I want a deal done early May rather than right when training camps are going on. But that's probably where we're going. So that's one thing that Randy's going to have to talk to when he's in Saskatchewan around. Like, when when's the deal coming down? And also, what's this genius sports thing again you were talking about, Grey Cup? What, 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 this new partner that you uh, held in such high regard, we'd really like to see some of that pay off. This is the part that's very humbling. I have to read something in the company of a broadcaster, knowing that I can't possibly do this as uh, oh, professionally I'm and eloquently here we go. as I'm, Jamie I'm does. Gonna, I'm going to get the popcorn here, Rob. You go okay. ahead. Uh, there, there'll be no you knows, there'll be no ums, and I'm going to nail this. I, uh, I feel the pressure, though, so this could be tough. But I have to read this. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave a review and a five-star rating. So far, so good. It helps us grow the podcast. I'm two for two with sentences. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm half done now. If you'd like to send us a question, you can email rob at rvanstone at postmedia.com, and we'll read it on the show. You can follow me, Rob, on Twitter, at Rob Vanstone, or Murray at Murray LP. Jamie, I nailed it. Where can we find you on Twitter? At Jamie Nye is where you can find me, or, of course, uh, the uh, show website for the Green Zone is Green Zone SK. Perfect. Murr, thank you so much, Jamie. We really appreciate you uh, taking 49 minutes and 38 seconds out of your busy day to, to join us. Uh, and uh, we've, we've all put candy to sleep, so ho hopefully the audience is more resilient. For well, Jamie, for Murray, for I'm dogs. Rob. Pardon me? I said it's a podcast for the dogs. It's a podcast. <laughs> <laughs>
Isn't she cute? <laughs> for, for Candy, I'm Rob Murray, Jamie. Thank you so much, and we'll do this again soon as events dictate. Take care.